All right. Uh, my name is Ed Glass. I am a group engineering manager on shared services on uh, Visual Studio Team Services. One of the things my team does is uh, look after our deployments and the way we deploy across our services. So I am going to talk about that. So my agenda is uh, I'll show you what it looked like in the early days of uh, team services. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, then some key transitions we made along the way. Then I'll show where we've come to today and uh, some of the future investments we're making and lessons learned. So in the early days, we came up with some principles. And these have been good principles. These have stood the test of time. So we still abide by these principles. Uh, one of them was the tools we use to deploy to the service are the tools we use uh, in a, every day in our dev and test environments. And this is pretty critical. I've heard of services where there's some special sauce that the ops team uses to go uh, deploy the service and nobody knows how to do it and well sure enough you get to production and bad things happen uh, this way you know we're exercising these bits all the time if a developer makes a mistake on authoring deployment they find out on their dev box not once we go to production a second principle is the quality signals we're going to look at to green light a deployment we're looking at those all the time every day You've heard our test story. I'm going to talk some more about that. We had this principle, uh, just that, that the quality signal wasn't always uh, very high fidelity. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, the other principle is there's no downtime deployments. So one thing this enables is us to deploy during working hours, which is pretty key for work-life balance for our engineers. Uh, so we don't want to be deploying at midnight on Saturday night and have to call people in when things go bad. Uh, so what did these early deployments look like? Uh, well, we had, this is a OneNote. I actually screenshotted a, a OneNote that we had back then. Um, and for each deployment, we'd fill out these questionnaires. And it actually is pretty long. So here's another page from that. And you can see from the scroll bar, this actually goes on and on. Uh, but these are things we did to prepare for deployment. And then the actual deployment script had you know, all these steps to run. And then we actually we, we deployed from a command line. And uh, the operations team had special access to these deployment machines and our production secrets. And they'd go fire up this command line. So you'll notice the background of this command line is red. And we did that so the operator knew they were operating against the production environment. If it had a red background, had a black background, it was a test environment uh, to help them avoid making mistakes. So our deployments really look like a Skype call with about 60 people on it, with an ops person sharing their screen and going through all these steps and everybody kind of crossing their fingers that it would work uh, well. Uh, we stood up the deployment in April of 2011. Uh, we waited about four months before doing our first deployment. And uh, with that came a ton of changes. And the deployment did not go very well. And we were gearing up for the build conference when we were going to announce our service and uh, took everything to get things stitched back together. And the problem with doing big deployments with lots of changes is there's lots of problems now intertwined and pulling those apart and kind of Figuring out what went wrong is harder and harder. So uh, we learned that. You can see uh, within a year we were went to our Sprintly deployments. And it was really a big impetus on how poorly these deployments went to motivate us to deploy more frequently. So summarizing some of the uh, problems we had and the early transformations we made. Uh, were these big payloads, so we went to Sprintly three-week deployments. Another problem that Buck alluded to was when we deployed, we had one single service. And so when we hit an issue, it impacted everybody. Uh, we were in early talks with the Windows team. He wanted to start using team services for work item tracking. And uh, clearly, that wasn't going to fly with the Windows team, you know, having our service be uh, flaky like that. 
so we introduced the ability to have multiple instances of, of TFS, which was our main service at that time. And then as we introduced new features, we had uh, introduced the ability to do that via microservices. Another clear problem with all those manual steps is people made mistakes. And some of those mistakes were really costly. I remember one in particular uh, operator ran a step out of order, and it took us a couple of days to recover from, from that problem. Um, so we adopted tooling. We adopted, if you've been around, you know about RMV1. Uh, there were some problems with RMV1, but actually it, it delivered a lot of value to us. Uh, one thing we said is, okay, hey, from now on we're, we're getting rid of the one note. If you want to make a change in production, you need to author it into our automation, and author it into the deployment. And we had the capability before, but for we kind of had a culture of, gosh, it's easier just to paste that in the uh, in the in the OneNote than to have to actually code it into the deployment. Um, but that got out of hand, uh, so so we just said, hey, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that anymore. Another uh, change was enabling engineers to run config changes against production, and a config change is basically running a PowerShell script. So it's pretty powerful. You can do a lot with it. We have to be careful about it. But you know, rather than um, calling an operator and say, hey, can you run this change for me in production, uh, we enabled that through our release management. And then we also, that enabled us to have an audit trail of changes that have been made. The other problem was serializing everything through the operations team uh, with only ops doing deployments. RM gave us the capability to have access control around who could queue deployments and who could approve deployments. So this was really enabling for the engineering team to be able to go ahead and deploy ourselves, especially as we spun up more microservices. So we wanted the team that owned the microservice to have control over when they deployed and not have to rely on a central team or, um, you know, uh, some higher up to give approval for, for their deployments. So it enabled those workflows, which was, uh, which was very good. And the other problem we hit was these are, we, sometimes we'd have bad deployments and they were immediately, uh, uh, would manifest themselves, but we would just proceed on. And we have two phases to our deployments. One is to update binaries, the other is to update our databases. Once we upgraded those databases, there's no rollback. We couldn't go back. Um, we've talked about the binary compatibility. New binaries know how to talk to the old database, but old binaries don't know how to talk to the new database. So once we serviced the databases, there was no rollback. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we introduced this 15-minute uh, health check period. And so we do this health check, and then if we detected an issue, we can then VIP swap back and roll back the deployment. We still had a fair number of issues. So we had a poor quality signal. You've heard all about that from Manil, and uh, even Bill talked about it yesterday. It really manifested itself when we went to deploy. So the problem was, you know, we'd finish the sprint and have what we thought was a pretty good pass rate, maybe it's 98%, and then come in on Monday morning, there's like 30 test failures, and so we're, we gotta go get the owners of those tests to come in and see, hey, is this a real problem or not? Should we block the production? And well, they start doing new things, we uncover issues or it just takes time, and uh, it would take us, you know, typically we weren't ready to deploy till Thursday of, of the sprint week. <clears throat> we still have this singleton service, uh, shared platform services, where it holds our identity, account information, group information, um, which is a single point of failure, um, which, you know, my team contributed to that service. It's really a very, very bad place to be because uh, there's no room for error. Some of my best engineers introduced bugs into that service that took all of VSTS down. And you know, you're doing your team a big disservice by making a little mistake that's hard to catch 
outside of production uh, to be able to take your service down. So having uh, an approach where you don't have no single points of failure is definitely something to design in from the start. The other thing is it's uh, no surprise, but a lot of issues take longer than 15 minutes to surface, so we'd move on with our deployments, bugs would surface, and now they start impacting customers and we have no, no means to roll back. So today we keep evolving, we're not done yet, still have, we still have a lot of work to do, uh, but we keep getting better. And I think that's another key message is we are always improving the way we're doing our deployments, always investing and uh, in making things better. But we've moved on from RMV1 to uh, Visual Studio Team Services release management. Uh, and that's been great. Uh, we work very closely with the release management team on you know, new features and making things better and better, and that keeps evolving. Uh, we've grown up our service, so we've, you know, we have a worldwide service now. We talked about the 31 microservices, some of them up to 15 instances. So we are doing a lot of deployments. So if you think about that, that doesn't scale without being fully automated. Um, we've also you know, democratized that by enabling each team that owns the, their service to be able to de deploy at their own cadence. We now have this high fidelity quality signal. So the end of, we're running the, our tests constantly throughout the sprint. If things turn red, you know, we're jumping on it. Uh, we've got the class of unit tests running as part of the build, so builds won't get through uh, without those passing. Um, and then we have our L2 tests running constantly. We've got the two buckets that Manil talked about of uh, self-test and self-host. <clears throat> but they're staying green, and Bill showed you one screenshot that wasn't quite realistic, but they really do stay green for the most part. So we come in on Monday morning to a green dashboard, and that's the signal we're using to deploy. So uh, most, uh, most sprints we're able to deploy on Monday morning. Um, Brian talked yesterday about our cadence. So we are bringing a new sprint payload every three weeks. And then every day, let's say that uh, you know, a customer reports a bug, or you know, sometimes we want to tweak features in production for usability, whatnot. Um, as engineers push changes to the release branch, they're going to get deployed the next day. And then there's a class of issue where, hey, we got an active LSI, we, we need to address it with a code fix, and so we call that a hot fix deployment, and that's done as needed. Here's my screenshot, so a little more realistic. You can see the one red cell is really a clear indicator of a test reliability issue because it turned green immediately after that. Um, but yeah, largely we, 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 we stay green on, on our tests and have worked really, really hard to drive out reliability issues. All right, any questions on that so far? All right. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, and I know it's maybe a detail here, but we covered so many things. You said the uh, the environments are changed by PowerShell scripts. We talked about uh, databases. Is there a, a, a tool or a part of Release Manager that runs the environment update scripts um, once and only once, or are, what's the the method for that? Is it is it part of using Azure, or is it? I mean, how do you run world? a config change? Okay, you, it just, looks just the same as our uh, prod deployments and that I'm gonna talk in a bit about our deployment rings and it works the same way, but basically we have a uh, release definition where you can plug a PowerShell script into. And the PowerShell script, we check into source control, it's in a Git repo, and then you configure through a parameter that PowerShell script into the release, and then uh, and then kick off the release. Okay, it, so it's a human decision to include that script in that particular release. Yes, it's a separate it's a separate release definition to do a config change. Got it. Okay, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, but, uh, you might want to talk about item potency and the importance of that because it sounded like that's what he was touching yeah. on. Uh, with, you know, if you deploy and the new one fails. Principles, how we 
Yeah, uh, okay, so we do have um, a rule that, so we have, you know, we got the binary updates, that's really kind of all or nothing. We get the new binaries or not. And then we have um, servicing steps that plug into a deployment, which are different actually than a config change. So the servicing steps run as part of the deployment. And the rule about that is your servicing step has to be rerunnable. And we have tests that run that will run and kill servicing at random points and then rerun to make sure it is in fact rerunnable. Uh, but the you know, scenario there is you got a step that's trying to update the database and it can, it can't get the lock so it fails, then we need to be able to rerun it. And so that's a key principle. Any other questions? Quick question. Yeah. In, and you may be covering this later, but um, are you still on the side? Are you still oh, doing you change <laughs> management processes? What's that? Are you still doing change management processes for deployments? Change man management processes. Um, we do have some change management processes in terms of what changes go into the release branch. So the policy around that is that it thing. Uh, Changes going to the release branch require M1 approval. And that's pretty much it. And then for the actual deployment, um, pretty much anybody can queue a deployment, and then um, M1s or le leads can approve the deployment. It used to be require M2. We kind of keep um, getting less and less process is how I describe it as we, as we go. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk about safe deployment. And uh, safe deployment, the term was born out of the Azure group uh, who looked at the way that uh, we deploy Azure and came away with some principles and rules and guidelines that help to uh, protect our customers as we deploy. So that's really what it's about. Uh, why, why we do it is to protect our customers from LSIs and bugs. So most of the LSIs that happen on our service are introduced by us, by deployments, by changes we make in our code, then deploys out and doesn't work right. Uh, so uh, what we do is deploy changes first to a very small set of customers who have signed up for uh, the risk and say, yeah, give me the changes first, and then we'll progressively roll out to larger and larger sets of customers. And then incorporated in that is also having automated health checks and rollback. Um, and, and bake time is another pretty important principle. So we segmented our uh, services into deployment rings. And this is the definition we have for kind of our biggest service is TFS, but all of our services define a set of uh, deployment rings. And the ring zero is customers with a high tolerance for risks and bugs. That's where MSNG is. That's where we live. Our MSNG account is on our scale unit zero. When we deploy binaries on Monday morning, they're going to scale unit zero. An interesting thing about Scale Unit Zero is it's in US West Central. It used to be that you know, we'd be uh, cruising along and then all of a sudden we'd get an incident in West Europe and say, well, what's going on in West Europe? You know, some, there's some hiccup with SQL. We haven't deployed any changes recently. We don't know of anything going on. Well, that just happened to be the first region that SQL Azure deployed new bits to. Right? And, but we had, didn't have visibility into that. So we've all aligned uh, and with Azure to deploy to US West Central first. So now if the SQL Azure team introduces a regression, it's gonna impact us on MSNG, right? a really good chance that it will. And so this has been really good for us to catch platform level issues. Next, you know, we, we use a lot of VSTS, but we don't use all of it. So for the areas we don't use, we want to go to a small scale unit so we can 
get enough of customers using the breadth of the product. So if we break something in a part of the product we're not using, you know, we can uncover it there before going out to a large scale unit. And so the other principle here is we want that to be relatively in a US uh, time zone. And the reason is some bugs only surface during peak hours. Uh, so if we have it during the US, we'll hit the issue during our daytime, can work any incidents that come up. Yeah, quick question. I, I was under the assumption that um, the rings were maps to data centers. But how do you know, I mean, how do you make sure that in ring zero there are accounts that use TFEC, that use hosted builds, and do, do you move them together or something and make sure that they have a certain characteristic so you can run certain tests or something? So ring zero, we don't. We don't really do anything special to get accounts in there that use the breadth of the product. So some issues will slip to ring one. And then ring one uh, today happens to be Brazil. Uh, so it's a, you know, not a huge scale unit, but big enough that you know, if we broke something, we, we'll find out. And then we, it, it's Brazil today, we could change that. It's not, not a fixed thing. Okay, then we deploy to a medium to a large uh, US data center, and there we can catch a class of scale issues uh, that, and, and we tend to find any other bugs that maybe didn't get uncovered in ring one. Any functional bugs, but mostly to catch scale issues uh, with our servicing, there's like a million and a half accounts in this data center, so um, it's, it's good to catch that class of issue. Then we deploy to a scale unit that has, uh, it's an internal, we have three internal scale units, so we pick one of those to deploy to. There's some scale and load characteristics we see on our internal accounts, we don't see uh, on public accounts. And so this gives us a chance to catch those classes of issues. So for example, MS Azure is in this scale unit. Um, they really hammer us in a lot of ways. Uh, and so then, you know, if we've regressed something, we can catch it there before we go to the next scale unit, which has the Windows team on it. So we'd rather catch it with the Azure team than the Windows team. Uh, yeah, and then we go to everyone else. Okay, so I mentioned bake time. This is an important uh, principle. Um, so we wanna allow bake time between phases of the deployment and you know, between the rings. Um, I had, and then yeah, we'll allow for our sprint deployments at least a day in between. I've got a, a graphic that'll show a little bit more clearly how we manage our sprint deployments. And then for our daily deployments and config changes, typically we do those over two days uh, with uh, delays in between the rings. And uh, yeah, so if there's latent, latent bugs, that they have time to surface. We had uh, one incident where we broke a particular kind of a build task. And before we were doing this, um, we didn't have the delay, so we were deploying faster. So maybe in the course of four or five hours, we deployed to the entire service. And it wasn't a hugely widely used build task, and by the time the customers noticed, hey, my build's failing, called support and got to us, and we figured out, well, crap, all of these, anybody using this task is broken, we had gone out to everybody. So then the, you know, dev, uh, dev lead, he got the fix, and put the fix in and you know, we deployed it and said, oh man, this is killing me. It's gonna take five hours to get this fix out to everybody. We need to make our deployments faster. And you know, the, really the converse was true. If we hadn't gone so fast, the bug would have surfaced. It wouldn't have gotten out to everybody. It wouldn't have created the huge uh, you know, issue that it had become. Um, and we had other classes of incidents that really only surfaced during peak times, so that's another important principle. So this is a typical Sprintly de deployment schedule. So along the top, we have 
Oh, question. Sorry, just on that note with the with the delays, is that are those delays kind of hard coded in, or are there approvals, or do you do any telemetry monitoring? Like how how are those delays? So built I'll in? talk more about that. Okay, but yeah, they are hard coded in right now. Okay. Yep. So we have the days of the sprint across the top, and the. So 15 days in a sprint, three weeks, uh, those are business days, and then the rings down the side. So on um, day zero, Monday, we do binaries to ring zero. So that's Monday, binaries to ring zero. And then we'll do a full deployment on Tuesday. If we didn't hit any bugs, if we hit bugs, sometimes we roll back on Monday. It's not uncommon. And then we'll do it again on Tuesday. Uh, but we want to get clean on our binary only deployments uh, before moving on. And then uh, typically we have you know, some bake time. And then Thursday we're going to ring two, bake time over the weekend. Then on Monday go to ring three. It's not wholly uncommon to uncover new bugs on ring three. Sometimes we even have to do a hot fix. Actually, most common hot fix is on uh, these two days, actually. Uh, but that's what it would look like. If we did a hotfix, we'd go through ring two because that's where the new bits were deployed to so far. And then you can see on. And then each day, we're doing daily deployments from the previous sprints for any bug fixes that went in. So that's what that looks like. And then the hotfix process, so yeah, we can do on-demand. Question? Oh, sorry. Can you go back one slide? Yep. So you do the hotfix to ring two because that's where you have the deployment? Yes. But, then, but the hotfix is done on the release branch? No, it is, always. So on day seven, the hotfix is on the release branch, and then you deploy the release branch further to three and four? On day seven, we're just doing a daily deployment. On day eight, we. I usually but that, that already includes the hotfix yeah, because so you're, still, include, you're only doing the release yes, branch. Because we're yeah. always releasing the latest green build. Yeah. And what if, I mean, I don't know if it happens, but probably it does. What if the uh, deployment error is not in the binaries but in a database update? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, each of these deployments will do database servicing too. Yeah, but I mean, you, you, do, you mentioned earlier that when you do a binary update, it's easy to roll back. You just pick the previous version of your binaries, but Correct. you can't roll back the database. Correct. So what if the error is in the database update? Well, you, then, yeah, then you got to put in a fix and then deploy the fix. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair question. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we always do. So in other words, you, you know, when somebody prepared this hotfix, it's going to include other changes, too. Any other changes that were introduced since the time we queued this build, it's going to include all those. So we don't kind of one-off cherry pick a hotfix and deploy just that. We just pick the latest. So it's going to, whenever you put something in the release branch, you got to know it could get deployed at any time. And then the hotfix, you know, we have a SEV0. Typically, that's going to be on one of our singleton services. So. Uh, we don't have ring definitions for those uh, by fiat. Um, but yeah, if it's a SEV1, it's not uncommon for us to hit uh, data shape issues in a particular uh, account, like uh, the Windows account. Or you know, some accounts might have some weird data shape uh, that becomes a SEV1 for them because it's very impactful. And we do have a capability of Deploying, we, we, for that class of issue, we want to go to ring zero first, validate, you know, things are looking good in production, and then, and then go to, uh, to the impacted scale unit. And then most of our incidents are SEV2, SEV3. Um, so in that case, you know, you put the fix in. We still have, we want to go through all the rings um, and, and introduce a few delays, uh, but it's, it's expedited to do it uh, within that day. All right, so we have some future work uh, slated. So Manil talked about the pre-flight uh, scale units. So we'll have a pre-flight for every service and then configure accounts to go you know, pre-flight of that service against the uh, prod 
of all the other services, and we get compat testing that way. Um, and then longer term, you know, to your question about, you know, the uh, signals. So when we are in these uh, delays here, right now, you know, we have the 15-minute check after binaries, and then we're sitting there, and it's a manual thing right now to roll back. So somebody's got to say, hey, wait, we got some bad problem, and then we'll go manually do the rollback. Just a sec. And then we, uh, so what we're working on is getting our L3 test signal outside in, as well as, you know, signals coming from our telemetry. And when we can detect things are red, then we'll be able to roll back. So that's something we're working with uh, the RM team on. You had a question? Could you describe the report mechanism when um, users say, oh, I found something, and you're in the middle of your deployment? Right. Do, are they contacting you? Are they reporting you through a web service, or are you just doing telemetry? I mean, how are you aware yes. that there is the problem? <laughs> yes. So it could be, um, uh, could be internal users, external users on Twitter, external users emailing Brian. <laughs> uh, could be, you know, through telemetry. We notice we have all kinds of alerts uh, configured against our telemetry. Uh, so we detect, Tom's going to talk more about it, but, you know, if we drop under our SLA, for example, we can detect that alert on it and then, you know, get in contact with the right folks to stop the deployment. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about our tooling. So we've moved to uh, release management in VSTS, uh, which has been very good. Um, I'm going to talk about tooling futures, still work we need to do. Uh, but this is what our deployments look like. So currently, you can see, so rank two, uh, rank zero, one, and two have only one scale unit in it. Rank three has three scale units. Ring four has about 11. Uh, but right now, this is how it's modeled in RM. So this is the actual screenshot. So what the heck is 4A? Uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, so um, 4A contains the Windows scale units, WestGS 2-1. And the reason we have that in a separate scale unit, I talked about, hey, if we have a particular issue that's affecting a, a, a scale unit, we have the capability to expedite that fix. And so it's not uncommon for us to hit issues in ring 4A in the Windows account. So what we can do is queue a fix to go to ring zero and then straight to 4A um, without having to go you know, impact all the other customers in ring four. So that's the idea there. Now we're working toward breaking all of our scale units into environments. And we have a short-term thing that's coming it's going to enable us to do that. The, um, you can imagine with 11, we want to cut out manual work there, right? So that uh, long term, there's going to be a notion of rings in RM. And then short term, we're going to do it by naming convention, but have, have that facility in there, which will be good. Because currently, if a deployment fails in ring four, what shows up in the tool is ring four failed. It's not very helpful. Uh, so this way, we'll be able to see exactly what scale unit failed and get the logs for that uh, more cleanly. So that'll be good. Okay, here's what the uh, an environment looks like. Uh, we have this update binaries step and the update database step. So these guys do the heavy lifting. And it's running the same command line script you saw in that very first uh, screenshot with the red command line, as well as what we run in our dev and test environments. Uh, so it's going to run that command line. Uh, and then these are how we have our delays configured. So right now, uh, you know, we configured the wait times with variables. And you can see it says manual intervention task, what the heck? Uh, but it's not manual at all. So the R RM team put in a special feature for us to say, 
Okay, you can put a timeout in there, and if nobody does anything in the timeout, it'll just continue. So we've configured it to continue. So really, these are just delays built into the deployment. Uh, just last sprint, the RM team delivered a delay task, so we'll be replacing these with the delay task. Uh, this is a deeper look at what the health check uh, question. Yeah, uh, ring one had an additional phase and task. Uh, what, would, what would that be? Is, Which one? I mean, between ring zero and ring one, there was like difference in the number of phases and tasks. Oh, yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, so um, this does a manual pause between rings. We have that on ring one. We have implemented that as waiting before the next ring. So you saw, you know, we do ring zero, wait 60 minutes, ring one. This is the wait 60 minutes, and there isn't one of those in ring zero. That's what that was. That was a good pickup. Any other Question. questions? Yeah? Um, what are the typical values in the pause? Like from ring zero to mm -hmm. all the way through ring four, what's a typical time duration? Um, I'll, I'll go back to... Um, Okay. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have done that. That's the delays we have. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. No, that's fine. It puts it in context, right? So an hour between binaries, and we're waiting longer earlier. Um, and then day two, you know, this takes about a day, so we put in a longer delay here because we have the time, so might as well. Question? Was that the build definition or release definition? Release definition. Oh, okay, okay. And one thing, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't get that fully, but here it says that basically in two days you update all the four rings, right? Yes. But in the next slide, with all the, the charts, it seems that you're doing this for a period of okay. many days. So this, this is showing one of these days. Okay, where we're going through all the rings with a daily deployment. So, like on this day, let's let's pick this day. You know, we're going to uh, ring zero and one with a new deployment. We're going to do a daily deployment to two, three, and four. What we'll do is uh, we start. Basically, we're starting right here. So we do ring two binaries, wait an hour, ring two servicing. Then the next day, we kick that same release off for rings three and four. Does that make sense? So it, it was uh, probably then uh, what I'm missing is what's the difference between full deployment and daily deployment? A full de there's full de no uh, okay so typically when we talk about a full deployment, it's the deployment to a ring that includes binaries and servicing. So there's really all the deployments are full deployments from that standpoint. Okay, I'll ask later. Okay. Got a quick question. Other questions? That. Only uh, uh, just a quick question about this. When you just give just an hour, uh, do you have some way of saying, hey, hey guys, new version is out, ring zero I'm talking about. Uh, new version is out, go ahead and take a look or go kick off the tires and, you know, let us know what exactly is, because just one hour, right? That's what I'm saying, you know, one hour, how can you get statistical sample that is shows it that it's nothing's going on? Yeah, so I think that's a good question of, well, so let's say you have a fix going into that build, and then you want to verify it. Um, we use a Teams channel, so we have a Teams chat to say, hey, we're doing the build now, or you know, we're doing the deployment, so anybody can come in there and look. Also, anybody can come on VSTS and look to see you know, where the deployment's at. Um, they can reach out, they say, hey, we want to stop after ring zero to validate. But normally we say, no, we're going through and we're not stopping. And uh, that was an interesting thing about, you know, I said teams have a way to file deployment blocking bugs. A lot of times what a team thinks is a deployment blocking bug isn't really deployment blocking, you know, because uh, it's a big team, a lot of, you know, a lot of changes going in. So we got to keep the train moving kind of thing. So, so for the smaller teams, then what we have is uh, more like a, an opt-in. People will say, hey, you know, there is a deployment going on if you're really invested on this. Mm -hmm. And then you have the casual user on, during the hour that might run into the issue, 
right? Yes, exactly. And considering that this is you know, something as big as you know, the SCS team, I suppose, that the, the, the num what is the sample? What's the number of people in that uh, ring zero that will be, that might be affected? Um, like you 600? Can share that. 600? Yeah. Huh? 600, depending on what time of day. 600? Yeah, yeah, I guess it depends on time. Four, 400, well, yeah, something this like that. Is, yeah. That's so, a lot, it's a big number. It's really, really bad when we take MSN down. It really yeah, yeah. sucks for so everybody. So I was just yeah. thinking that 600, well, it's still a very good number to, to hit. Uh, statistically, then you might have some people that, not, that even know about the deployment that might hit that particular functionality and then will help test. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, I was just concerned more when you go through other rings, uh, how, I mean, because you had one hour, two hours, that just didn't seem too much for me for you to I see. Engage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a good question of, you know, getting through a deployment, how long is long enough, and, um, you know, the longer term I'm going to talk about, but the splitting up binaries and servicing so we can roll back any time. That's the long term. Right now what it looks like is, okay, I'll change the, the, I mean, I'll hit the floor, and if nobody yells, fire, I'll keep going. That's right, basically, yeah. We do have the basic, you know, perf counter health check. Okay. Too, yep. And, you know, we got uh, alerts firing. That's another signal we get. Uh, um, so, you know, we've got a 99.9 .9 SLA, and if we drop below that, and we drop below through errors and slow uh, requests, it'll trigger an alert, which would then, you know, trigger us to stop the deployment. So it's, it's a combination of user action and the telemetry. Yes. Thanks. Yep. So I'm hoping not, I'm, I'm not reading much into the slide, but between this slide and the previous slide, it's kind of a little confusing. So the dailies over here have a different color, and after the full deployment is done, the daily is again in a different color over here on this slide. And if you go to the previous slide, so here we are saying that uh, on day one, we are deploying in ring zero, and then we are deploying in ring one, as well as in ring two. Yes. And then ring three gets on day two, and ring four also gets on day two. But if yes. you go to the next slide, you are Yeah, not good, good point. I had a slide with actual build numbers in here, which was just a lot of information. But there's actually, on here, the build here is a 12 build. The build going here is a 11 build. So actually, we take this build and deploy it like that. I'm sorry? Uh, the build, okay, so on this day, the 11th, we'll take a green build, and we deploy it through ring two, okay? okay? Now that deployment sits overnight, and then the next day continues on three and four. So then what happens in that, uh, so in the very same day on day 11, you have an, two other deployments on day uh, for three and four. Is that yes. a previous build? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And is there any particular reason about color coding these before the full build and after the full build, the dailies are different colored? Like this is... Oh, it's different sprint bits. Correct. So that's the previous uh, build that is there. Yeah, this is, is a, like, you know, 123 build. This is the 124 builds. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. So just so I understand the slide, are, are you saying uh, for that hot fix between six and seven? Yeah. That means on one of those days you did two deployments? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Just curious why you wouldn't put that as part of your daily build. Why what? Why you wouldn't do the hot fix as part of the daily build. Um, because there's an LSI that we need to mitigate. Okay. And it can't wait till the next day. Fair that was oh. that SEV2, you know, zero, one, or two. If you guys have even a SEV2, we want to get a fix out. Okay, fair enough. Yep. All right, yep. And if this is too in the weeds, push me off, feel free. Um, you got two day deployments, multiple environments. Um, is, your, is your configuration for release manager somehow in version control or do you use some other method to mitigate uh, someone changing a task, changing a setting, changing a parameter that would make the ring four deployment different from the ring zero deployment for the same build version? Yeah, great question. Uh, we do not have protection for that. So we do move scale units between the rings. You just got to do it carefully. 
Yeah. Yep. Could you then share also the slides with with the numbers here because you see yeah, that it's people in the backup. Have, have uh, a, it's in just, the backup. Just put it in the presentation. What's that? At the end. Yeah. This one with the numbers and the builds and the sprints. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would actually make a help a lot because Thank you. I had to kind of you know think about it for a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fair. And uh, one more question: Is it necessary to have these five rings, or can I reduce the number of rings? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you know um, definitely you can reduce it. We have some of our microservices have four rings, and so it just really depends on. But I think you know if you think about this with terms of your deployment and your how you deploy your services, it's a good thing to think about. You know because. Um, initially, we just thought about setting up new TFS instances when we felt like one was full. And now we think about it more of, you know, in terms of blast radius and safe deployments. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I think four so is... Having three or four rings should be just fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those are good questions. Thank you. I think we talked about this and this. And I, I've talked about most of these things. I'll reiterate. Um, so we're going to model each scale unit as an environment and then let RM control the parallelization. We get a bunch of wins out of that um, for our tooling. And then we have this new delay task. We're going to be replacing our manual intervention tasks with. Um, it's confusing, the manual intervention task, for people who aren't used to seeing that. They come in and say, well, wait a minute, what's that? Uh, the other thing, if you set the delay to zero on the manual intervention task, it means wait forever. So that's really confusing. Uh, and then, yeah, incorporating this outside in and L3 uh, test uh, signals into our decision to roll back. And so any time during that wait period between binaries and servicing, we'll be able to roll back. Okay, so uh, you know, I know uh, Buck talked this morning some about uh, controlling uh, exposure of features to customers. I wanted to talk about it in the context of these deployments and uh, rings and how to think about that. We really, we really have we have these four mechanisms for controlling exposure to customers. So we have the safe deployment where bits move through the rings. We have our feature flag tools customer opt-in and opt-out, and then we have A-B testing. So as a team, we really don't use A-B testing. And I'm not sure why, but it's just not something we've done a whole lot of. Um, so I'm not going to talk any more about that. Just, just skip that. <laughs> we can do it, but we don't. So. Uh, so our feature flag. So we have this notion of stages. and. Stage zero are internal accounts, and just recently we made a uh, we had people who said, "Hey, when that stuff's on on uh, MSN, just as soon as it's there, I want to enable these feature flags. But when I do, I get errors because not all the rings stage zero accounts are on issue zero. So we kind of fixed that. So we made it so that we moved all those accounts onto uh, issue zero. So. Stage zero is really, it's the MSNG account, plus like I've got some test accounts and other people on the team have test accounts. So uh, Brian's uh, site that he runs his farm is on that, uh, and stage zero. Um, and then stage one, uh, you know, some of you might have your accounts in stage one, and the idea is so we have a new feature. We want to enable it for customers, so we do stage zero first and then stage one. Stage one's got maybe 175 accounts in it. Well, what does that look like with our deployments? So let's say you've got a new feature in Sprint 124, and then we go and you know, we deploy Sprint 124 to ring zero. Well, now we're able to enable the feature flag for ring uh, stage zero accounts because we know they're all in ring zero. Um, but for the other accounts, they could be anywhere. And so then you really got to wait till the deployment proceeds through all the rings, and then you're able to light up the feature flag for customers in stage one. So that's how those two things uh, compose together. 
Question? So is that again automatic via PowerShell or is it manual? The feature flags? Yeah. It, you can do it either way. Uh, so you can enable and disable feature flags as part of the deployment. Now these stage zero and stage one, we have a feature flag tool that has configured with the list of stage zero and stage one, stage one accounts. So it'll go, and Buck showed a screenshot of that. It's a kind of this crappy internal web UI uh, that does that. Yeah, if we're not already a stage one account, how do we go about getting ourselves included in that? Uh, that's a good question. Let's see. You could shoot me an email. I'll, yeah. Uh, okay, any other questions? No. So is okay. it open for anybody to kind of sign up for a stage zero or a sta sorry, a stage one account? Can we see Anybody? No, no. I mean, it's, partners? Yes. Okay. If we yeah. would like to get added to that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, shoot me an email. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then we have customer opt-in and opt-out. So this is a relatively new thing. Uh, we rolled out the new nav this way, and it's been really good. Um, but if you go to your profile, there's a preview features uh, menu item there. And then, so this is me on MSN, and I can hit that drop down, and if you're an account admin, turn features on and off for your account. Um, and then you can see some of these are on and some are off. And so the engineer can decide when it's usually engineer uh, working with the PM to decide on a rollout plan for their feature. So um, a lot of times initially we'll roll things out default off and then go into some test accounts and uh, turn it on and test it out in production. Then you know we might go to the MSNG account, turn it on in MSNG, start getting feedback and say, oh crap, that doesn't work very good, turn it off. Uh, and then iterate, and then we're able to iterate that way. And then um, we can control that for external accounts as well and say, okay, it's going to be default off. We'll give it a couple of sprints of iteration in MSNG, and then we feel like, okay, we're, we're ready to turn this on by default for customers, and then they can always opt out. And then when a customer opts out, we pop up and say, hey, why are you opting out? And then you know we collect this data from our customers and can iterate like that. Um, and then eventually these, these go away and they just become, that's the way the product works. Uh, but it's been a good way to introduce new features. So is this driven by uh, feature flags as well or this is a different way? Uh, There's different feature flags on the back end okay. and we call this a contributed feature. Uh, so the like with extension management, uh, there's these contribution points where you can plug into menus and different points in the UI. And uh, the way we discover those contributions, that's how these are actually surfaced here. So uh, it's loosely coupled um, for the developer. The way we discover these is uh, through this generic contribution. And uh, we look for contributions for the feature service. So when you surface that to customers, um, do you give them a warning when this is going to go away at some point or uh, you know, at, at some day they're just going to wake up and it's going to be gone? Um, uh, I guess it depends. Uh, most things, no. We just, you know, make it so. Um, yeah, like the nav was very disruptive change just because people's motor you know, memory got interrupted. So changes like that we're a little more careful about. Um, it's kind of hard to communicate those things also, you know, in a way that doesn't become annoying and noisy. Uh, so that's something where, yeah, that's it's kind of tricky. Any other questions? Okay, so I also want to talk about compatibility in the context of deployments and this has come up in Buck's talk and Manil's talk, so I'm just going to kind of summarize it here. Um, there's actually a lot of different compatibility uh, considerations that we have, and I'm going to talk about three of them, and there's more. Really, the takeaway for you is to think through, you know, for the services you're developing, what are the types of uh, compatibility 
that you have to be concerned about, and then develop coding patterns uh, that enable you to deal with them. Uh, so this, you know, we deploy new binaries before we deploy a new database. So this is what, you know, this code might look like is say, hey, there's a new serialized process in the 124, and you can defensively code to see if that's null. Um, and this happens to be a serializer, and it's going to go ahead and uh, put something in there so that we don't get null refs if people are expecting that to be filled. Um, and then here's just, I did a quick uh, unit test where we're forcing this condition on a definition, you know, versus actually having different instances of the services. Uh, this is a way to do it via unit test. Uh, it's kind of clever. Uh, the other uh, level of compatibility is we have service to service compat, so we can have 124 TFS calling 123 SPS and similar 123 TFS calling 124 SPS. And when a call is made and we get a JSON artifact and a call, it includes a version on it. And so similarly, you can write code to say, hey, if this is an older resource and then you know it's going to be specific to whatever that thing is and what you got to do to protect yourself against it. Uh, it ain't pretty, but that's kind of what the code's going to look like. Uh, and somebody had asked about, hey, do you come back around and clean stuff up? And um, yes, we, we do. We don't enforce it, though. You know, we don't have any metrics around to say how much M120 uh, code do we have sitting around still. Uh, and then the last kind of thing to think about is um, actually persisted data. Uh, so here we store, oh, sorry, um, like build, pro, build, this is a build definition binder. So we store build definitions as JSON in the database. So we have a 124 database, 124 binaries, but we might be reading a 120 uh, build definition. Um, there's different ways to handle that. Sometimes as part of upgrade, we'll choose to upgrade the assets as well. Um, sometimes we'll just deal with different versions of the assets. So there's different strategies you can employ uh, to handle the, the compatibility of your resources. All right, any questions about that? All right, and that uh, is my last part of content. So to wrap up, um, some key takeaways. You might think deployment's painful. You're going to do it less often. The truth is the opposite. The more you do it, the easier it's going to get. So deploy often. Uh, get a clear and reliable test signal uh, so you can stay green throughout the sprint. That'll make it so when you're ready to deploy, you can actually go deploy and you're not hit by surprises. If you can have consistent tooling uh, throughout dev test and, uh, and, and your production deployments, so there's no special sauce you know, happening when you go to deploy, because when you have special things happening, at deploy time they break. They don't work. So this is a, a good technique uh, to harden your deployment tooling. Uh, doesn't have to be RM, but uh, use a tool to uh, automate and orchestrate your deployments. Uh, we've gotten a lot of benefits from that um, that, I've, that I've talked about. And you know, a key one is enabling your engineering team to do deployments. Uh, my last takeaway is follow those safe deployment tra practices. So think about you know, if you're implementing services, how can you have these isolated instances of your service and then incrementally deploy to them uh, so that you know, as you introduce bugs as part of your deployment, you're able to shield most of your customers from them. All right, and that's the conclusion of my talk. Uh, if you have any more questions for me. Yep. Quick question here about your usage of RM. There, are no, there is no hidden feature. You're using the same thing that everybody else has access to, right? Correct, yes, same thing. Oh, I, I was going to say a little bit more about that, but uh, you know, sometimes we'll get those features enabled, you know, First maybe, you, but yeah, yeah, but no, no secret sauce there. It's a great um, in fact, you know, I've got a pretty long list of requirements I've sent to Gopi. And, you know, I think one of them was this notion of ring and deployment group or whatever, right? And they're kind of, oh, that's, that's too complicated. That's just another thing our users, I don't know how useful. And then 
Brian said something to him about it. Now they're planning to do it, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, nice. Thank you. Okay. It's a great case for RM, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's been really good. I mean, we were really driving improvements in our. Before you guys go, I want to say, share this before I forget again, but in the book mentioned, so we deploy from MSN, and so, you know, we do builds on MSN, our artif build artifacts are stored there, we do our deployments from there. So, what happens when we break MSN? You know, so we deploy to ring zero and our deployments break. Um, well, we go back to that red command line, <laughs> actually. So we go hop on one of the deployment machines and we'll deploy to, right, you know, and then we got to go get the code fix and um, you know, kind of put it on the deployment machine and then we can deploy. And we practice that every other sprint or so just to make sure it still works. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of a funny thing. Uh, so there's some questions, yep. So, um, if we can go back to the slide where we are showing all the rings, or one of the tasks. In RM? Yeah. Okay. I'm clicking it. Complementary to his question is, could you also show that slide that it's in the back with all the build numbers? Yeah, I have it hidden, so I got to edit my deck to do that. <laughs> did, I, did I go by it already? No. Okay. Dang, this is slow. All right. Yeah, we can stay on that. This one. That's, yeah, okay. So we run the, we check in the code. We have a build, we have a single build definition, I believe, in this case, where. Yes, we, we have, have one repo. Set up things. And one, well, actually, we have several build definitions that build the product in different flavors. Uh, so, and one of those we used to deploy. So, uh, specifically, we sign binaries that we deploy to. Uh, the service, and then we have other builds that don't sign that we can pick up more quickly for our test environments. We have other builds that package up TFS on-prem. So you know, same code, same repo, different build to go build you know, the MSI. Yep. Okay, so once you got the build artifacts, then automatically it triggers uh, the release definition to pick up those artifacts and start deploying on the No, actually that's uh, manually okay. a deployment driver We'll decide what build to pick up and go, you know, create a new release and pick the build that they want to deploy. Okay. So and we go to that, you know, the screen with all the green, you know, find one that's green. And then we also have this way of the, I mentioned the blocking bugs uh, facility. So we'll go find a green build, check there's no blocking bugs, and then queue the deployment. And uh, are there any functional tests being run as well on Ring Zero? No, that's the L3 test that we're L3, working on. That's the future. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're coming soon. I mean, we're actively working on it. Okay. Thanks. There's some more questions. Uh, so one of the things about the DevOps mindset is uh, to have engineers uh, not only writing the code but actually running it. Uh, so can you talk to how is that handled within your team? Like, um, so who is in charge of creating those builds, creating those releases? Uh, I'm talking about like not, not triggering them, I'm talking about like creating actually the, the release definition, the build definition. Uh, is that uh, created by the, engin uh, the engineering team uh, uh, on, the, on their own or there's another team? And then um, whether you, ha so when you are in that deployment phase, right, and you are uh, planning for how you're going to run your application, right, you need to be on kind of like a s common, uh, platform or common framework, right? You don't want people to just decide on, you know, I want to run my service this way while another team is doing it another way. Right. How do you actually standardize or align on those things? And whether it is like a team that's doing that or this is because, you know, we talk about autonomy, uh, how autonomous uh, our teams, you know, decide on those kind of things. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So what does it look like? I'm on a team. I want to stand up a new service. What does that look like? So we have this uh, framework that you had talked about, and we have a sample service that runs on the framework. So typically, if you're going to start a new service, you start with a sample, make a copy of it, and then you, know, you start going, because it's pretty kind of bare bones. Uh, but then you can have that. Now, we have one build. So you're going to define that each uh, independent service is a root off the uh, rooted off the source tree, so you're going to create your service within that. 
then it's going to be part of the build. So it's going to be part of the CI and you know, all that. Um, now to get test running, the team that owns that has to set up the test runs for their service. And so we've got facilities for, um, you know, we've got machine pools and test machine pools and uh, so you can get your test runs up and running on your service. Um, then, so now you say, okay, well, I think I'm ready to go to production. So typically, you're going to be working on this two or three sprints. Once it goes into production, it's like this airplane flying. You know, you got to do all your servicing, you know, on the flying airplane from that point on. So I tell people, well, be careful about when you do that because you've got a new commitment you're making once you do. Um, but now you want to deploy the service. There's different levels of support. And we've got the different geos. Uh, so we've got you know, stuff in the US and Europe and kind of all over. Well, typically, we're going to stand it up on SU0 first. And then you know, try it out in production. And then um, you know, on other services, let's say it integrates back into TFS. Um, we do that through extensions, like release management runs as an extension. And um, we'll configure that on the MSNG account to do release management, and then so other accounts won't get it. Uh, so that's kind of how we control the servicing the new UI. So just to follow up on that, right? So let's say you know I'm a team, and uh, I'm part of the team, and, and uh, part of what I'm doing, I need a new, like probably stand up a new cache or something, right? I mean, probably it's not, it doesn't exist currently, okay. right? Um, so do I have to go through another, like, so I'm part of the, that engineering, engineering team, right? Do I have to go to another team to get that done? Do I do it myself? Do I write actually the, the code, infrastructure as code to actually do that and deploy it and yes. um, I mean, able to do that or? Yes. Do I, so. Yes, yeah, that would be you. Now, so we kind of, you know, vet new architectural patterns. So if you're going to take on a new architectural pattern, there's a bunch of work around that. Um, one thing is, you know, if your bits are eventually going to run on TFS uh, on-prem, you know, and so you take a dependency on, you know, some service in Azure, you got to figure out, you know, how is that going to work? So we got some services running on table storage. Well, there's not a one-to-one -one of table storage to SQL. You could kind of think there might be, but there's work to do to make that happen. Uh, so you got to do the work to make that happen. Um, we took on, you know, Redis. Um, on my framework teams in a way that if Redis wasn't there, it's just going to keep working on-prem. Uh, but if you're a microservice, you want to take on some new architectural pattern, there's a ton of security work. You know, you got to figure out the on-prem, you got to figure out the deployment, the telemetry. You know, it's, so if you just follow the architectural patterns that have been established, you get all that for free. If you're going to do something new, there's a lot of work you got to do to get, to get that going. And you're free to do that. Like, if you want to take that work, you can just do you know, it. Really we've got, to do it. We got an uh, architectural, um, I guess, V team. And so we want to take new patterns to that V team. Uh, you know, I think you got to get, probably going to want to get buy off from your director, go through this architectural V team so we can vet it. Um, but yeah, ultimately, that would be. That would be up to you. Yeah. Question? Are you able to show this actually in VSTS? You know, the, the, seeing them on the slides is good, but can we see it oh, kind of in you know, VSTS yeah. to build and question. kind of release definitions? Uh, OK, I'll show you. Uh, here's the team channel I talked about. So people can come in here and chat. You know, if they got issues going on or whatever. And we did. We had to do a hot fix on Friday night, this past Friday night. And so the DRI put a note in the team channel to the deployment driver saying, hey, we, we had to do a hot fix. So here's our TFS prod deployments. <clears throat> um, this one, so you can see this is 122. This is a little confusing. I don't know what happened here. Uh, Honestly, so this is our 123 deployment happening right now. So we are going to ring two today. You can see that's going on right now. 
And then we're taking the 122 bits through rings uh, 3 and 4 and 4A. All right, now this is kind of weird. This doesn't usually happen. I'm not sure what happened. So uh, that must have happened when I was pre preparing for my talk today. Um, and then let's see what else is interesting here. So you can see here we went to um, ring zero with the 123 build, and you know the rest of the rings with a 122 build. So if I go, let's see, if I go look at this one, um, look at the history. So you can see 918. Um, we succeeded. So we 916, which was. Friday. Oh, that that was the we did that Friday. That was the uh, Friday night. It's 1:03 a.m. That that was not a fun night, uh, but we did that. And then you can see then Monday we carried that through to the rest of the rings. All right. And then here's my kind of uh, I do. This is our runs dashboard. <clears throat> so this is master. You can see these are, I'm almost certain, flaky tests. Um, you can see a little bit of flakiness going on here, uh, but mostly green. So when we go to deploy, so this morning, this is our 123 uh, run. So if I hover here, you can see, uh, sorry, where'd my clicker go? This thing showing M123, it's an M123 build. All right, and then this panel is 122. Okay, so if we're gonna go to deploy 122, we'll come over here and find a good 122 build, so we would deploy the 15 build. And uh, so yeah, so that's how it goes. Does that Can make you sense? Can you showcase the build and the release definitions, please? The release, you wanna see the release definition? Sure. Um, so it's my screenshot, I promise you. Let's see. So I go here, go here. So here's that screenshot I showed you, and then you know if we go. Uh, it was just a good. We wanted to confirm. <laughs> trust but verify. <laughs> and here's the tasks. So I can show you. Um, let's see. The run on agent task. So let me see here. Our variables. So if I go here. Oh, see, I am used to looking at this to approve a deployment. Okay, when we have these variables, uh, this just looks different to me. Hang on. <laughs> What's that? Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you. So these are our manual intervention tasks here, which are configured with a variable for pausing. Where is that? Yeah, so it's this thing. And then I can't figure out, so I, I'm used to approving and deployment on the variables I can switch. Uh, Gopi, can you help me out here? Can you just go to the variables tab and click on the grid more? Uh, the process variables, the first one. Process, oh, click on the grid? The grid one. That give you the final view. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm not used to this view. I'm sorry. But here you can see the pause time configuration by default for each of our uh, pause between deployments. What's that? That's a 123 feature. Uh, no, I, it looks different when you're when you're approving deployments versus uh, the editor. <laughs> all right, does all that make sense? Definitely. Um, I'll show you this. This is zero. This is our ring. Um, three we have set to zero to stop after ring two. That's what that zero means. So. Um, yeah, any other questions? I think, uh, like, here's the deploy command. Just runs that uh, PowerShell script. 
Anything else interesting you want to see? I would, I would like to, to see the relation with, uh, with the release branch because you, you told about many teams that, uh, that, were, that were in control to, to, to do their own release. Right. But since you're all, I, I assume there is only one release branch per sprint, so they do their bug fixing, I think. So yeah, can, so here's can, can the show how it relates. That's releases 123. We're getting lots of check ins in throughout the day. And these are going to different services. So um, then when you want to do a service, we've got the build. So we have this is the release build. It's the vso.release.ci. So this is the one doing the signing. So you can see here's a dot 36 build. Um, so if I come over here, I can see the dot .36 build. Here's the tests that are running for that build. Uh, the tests are configured as release definitions as well. It's a little confusing, uh, but yeah, each of these, like the oh, didn't mean like the self host is a release definition that then goes and runs tests. Um, that's how that's working. And, and to, to add to that, because the release branch is created uh, at the start of the sprint, end of the sprint, so in the sprint, to, to, yeah. to deploy. Uh, and all the check-ins that are done on the release branch are basically bug fixes then? Yes. Okay. It's you know, up to the lead. You know, we'll do some feature tweaks in there too. Or if we've got the build conference coming up, and we promised some big feature, and there's a lot of feature work to do. You know, then we, we can do feature work in the release branch too. Uh, it just yeah, depends on the circumstances. But typically it's going to be bug fixes or um, you know, polishing for features. All right, let's see if there's anything else I want to show you about this. Um, here's my blocking bugs query. I'll just show you that. Um, so we have these different tags people can put on a bug to mark it as a blocking bug. All right, cool. I'm glad. Who asked me for the demo? That was good. Uh, okay, any other questions for me? You still going to show that slide at the end of the? Oh man! Okay. <laughs> I hope it. I hope it's what I, I think it is. So let me see. Uh, yeah, there it is. See, what happened? <laughs> what the heck? I didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, weird. You jumped out of presenter mode. You gotta like duplicate your screen or something. I didn't. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So here you can see. I guess I should have showed that slide. I, I, I dumbed it down. But here's the 8.2 build going through 7.1, and it hops over to the next day. Now it makes sense. Perfect sense. Thank you. <laughs> Lesson learned. There you go. All right. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and I, I guess, I, okay, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So this may be there weren't any bug fixes or changes. It's pretty late. You know, by this time it's week four. We've been out there for three weeks, and maybe there's a day when we don't have a deployment. just depends if there's fixes to go out. Um, but, yeah, the 112, 112, this is showing, you know, the progression of 112 builds. This is 111. These are 111 builds. Also, you know, it's showing different number, dot one, dot two, whatever, dot 12, and you could see, you know, from our builds, it could be dot one, dot two, dot 12, just depends how many commits we had that day. Uh, the number over there at the bottom is in, in blue, it's not very clear, but I, be, I hope that is, yeah, that is that six? One, one twelve, six, dot one. So you're basically we're deploying 6.1 in, in ring three and four on day six. Is that correct? Uh, it's, a a color, it's a color bug. It should be this light green shade. 
Correct, yeah, but it's the same bill that's going over there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, my this, understanding, it's this correct? bill going here, yes. Yep. Okay, and then you have a new set of bills starting in uh, zero, to, 0 to 2, which eventually kind of keep on sliding in the exactly. same way. Exactly, exactly. So somewhere down, let's say, uh, is that the hot fix uh, after day 9? Yeah, yeah. So that hot fix is being deployed in all the environments at the same time? Well, it depends on the severity. That's because but typically it's going to be on the same day. Same day. Yes. Because the same uh, bill would be whatever that thing, 9.2 or something. So yeah, 9.12. 9 9 yeah. Yes. That's going to be rolled in all the environments. Exactly. Okay. Yep, because they're all experiencing this bug. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, this makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. I think that's a wrap. You got any more questions for me? Oh, and we got 30 minutes. That's cool. I thought we'd have more, but I'm glad you asked all the questions. That was good. So thank you.